Sam with uh, Zishan from Smile to Jannah. And uh, as you know, he's one of my best friends. We grew up together. So basically, there's a lot of things happening in the world right now. Yeah. And uh, people are confused. People don't know what's happening. Uh, they don't know what to do. <clears throat> and uh, many people know, as you know, I've moved to South Turkey. And uh, just don't tell the authorities about this. <laughs> so I like how you're saying that. In a video that's being posted online, <laughs> it's public to thousands of people. So anyway, look, the thing is, right, um, when I went to Turkey, right, I went there for a holiday. Yeah, for the past five, six years, I was going there for a holiday, enjoying myself. But then suddenly the virus hit in 2020. And, uh, you know, many conspiracy theories were coming out. This is happening. That's going to happen. They're trying to control us. The Great Reset. What all this crap about World War Three just happened now. Starting off, they're saying. And obviously we know the signs of the Day of Judgment. We know about the Malhamma, the Great War. That might take place, you know, before uh, the Jal appears, <clears throat> and then we know about that guy, yeah, yeah, and we know also about the famine, you know, the food crisis that's been happen. On top of that, we've got the oil crisis. We've got, uh, I mean, things happening all around the world, anyway. Uh, so a lot of things to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, look, then this 2020 that happened, yeah, and then 2021 I came down to England back, and one of my best friends who, mashallah, would never ever speak about, you know, politics or speak about world events. You know, subhanAllah, that guy started talking about these things. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so, let, me just, let me pause the video, sir. <laughs> Sorry, we just got interrupted. Um, so basically, um, I mean, look, it's a bit like a shooting into the air here right now. Do you understand? We don't know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. But it kind of seems like it's going to fusion now. Do you understand? It's going towards, it's, it's getting more narrower. Do you understand? I mean, most of the scholars already said that the ma- minor signs have already been done. And, you know, the major signs are to be, uh, are going to happen now. So, and then you've got this World Economic Forum, you've got the Great Reset, you've got, you know, digital currencies coming out. And at the same time, you've got, um, you know, this virus. Yeah, and we don't know which is the virus going to increase, are they going to bring out another virus, you know, to control people. So, and the food shortages, the oil shortages, the money, the, you know, uh, in every angle, it seems like it's getting, do you understand, it's like it's going to pop. Do you understand? And uh, as I told you about that person, you know, one of our best friends, and mashallah, he was one of the most pious people I, I ever met, you know, in, in probably in my life, you know, in, living in England as a youngster. And... Um, even he would never talk about politics. You know him, isn't it? Mm. And subhanAllah, that guy went into hiding. I mean, he's literally disappeared. You know, so it makes you wonder. And he, he, you know, last Ramadan, yeah, before Ramadan uh, last year, he came up to me and he said to me, look, something very big is going to happen before the next Ramadan. And then this Ukraine thing happened. You know, so he, he was saying that the entire world is going to change the way it's running right now. The entire work is going to start running in a different different direction. So, what but, do you think? What do you think about all of this thing? But about? that something big is going to happen before next Ramadan. That could be anything. Uh, there's statistically there's always something going to happen. Is, yeah, no, but I mean something that points towards that's uh, been happening every year. I mean, I get that. Yeah, yeah whether it's LGBT becoming worse, whether it's um, certain laws changing, like in the UK. If you were born in this country, that was it. But now, it would be, you're born in the country, you can still be deported. <laughs> so laws are constantly changing. Um, governments are switching Labour to Conservative, and then a far right rising. It happens every year. So but, that, but don't you think it's too much happening in one go right now? Before, it used to be one event. Do you understand? And that event would take over for several months. Now it seems like there's like in succession. It, it, not even in succession. There are like multiple things happening in one go. Yeah, simultaneously. If you understand, and yeah. and it's kind of connecting to what the signs of the day of judgment they prophesied. You know that was going to happen. That's what's kind of scary. Yeah, there's there's something for us to understand, which is exegesis, and there's eisegesis. Okay. So exegesis is something that you take out of what Do you want me to pause the video now? <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we look that up? Can I, can I look that up? Do we have enough time? So, so exegesis is something you take out of the text. Yeah, like tafsir. Eisegesis is when you put your own understanding to the text. That's all it is. Exegesis you take out. Eisegesis you put in. And unfortunately and sadly, nowadays a lot of people are doing eisegesis. 
they put in their own understanding of psychology, their own understanding of anthropology and culture and sociology, and their own understanding of the end times. Oh, this verse means this. Look, we cannot definitely put our interpretation of something into the text. Yeah. Yeah. This is something that we say a lot to Dais, people that are doing the Dawah. And we're told as well by seniors that somebody will come along and say, oh, this verse is indicating to Big Bang Theory or this or that. But science, the philosophy of science dictates that science changes. The science by its nature is bound to change. That's what makes it science. But the Quran never changes. Yeah, the Quran never but, changes. But you know the problem with the science of the day of judgment? You know it's vague. Yeah. It's not clear cut, it's not thing. Exactly. And when you spoke to the scholars, you know, our local scholars about yes. it, many of them, uh, multiple not They're of one. the opinion And they said, look, we can't say he's wrong yes. or his opinion exactly. is wrong. You know, like we know the controversial scholar, you know, Sheikh Umar Hussein. You know, many people, uh, you know, they follow partly what he says. Yes. You know, I mean, let's face it. I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, for example, when I made this group, I made this little group and uh, mashallah, this group kind of, you know, blew up. A lot of people started to coming in it. Sorry, I don't know about that. Use that word. But a lot of people came into it, do you understand? And I never knew so many people who were interested in it. Yeah, and many of them got their initial, you could say, boost from Imran Hussein. But they didn't 100% listen to him because he's a Turkey hater. And they chose Turkey as their place to go to do Hijrah, mm. to leave a non-Muslim country and go to a Muslim country. But then it, the Hijrah wasn't just for that sake don't, don't Muslim mistake, and non-Muslim. Yeah, don't mistake correlation for causation. Yeah. Now, if you're saying... So correlation is when all you've got all the dots that are going in a specific direction. I understand. It's not because of the cause. I yeah, know. yeah, exactly. So if you're attributing the cause as Imran Hussein and you're saying, but they're going to Turkey, which is the opposite of what he's suggesting, then he's a cog in the machine. He is not the one that's um, that's causing all this. He's somebody that is seeing what's going on and he's giving an explanation. That implies there is something going on. So with regards to everything that's going on, that's the pattern. Imran Hussein is given his pattern. Other people are giving different patterns. But I think most people are in consensus that things are going wrong. They're going wrong, like you said, simultaneously. And they're going uh, wrong in succession. Yeah, And because of that, I would also add in social media is amplifying this as well. Whilst before... We didn't know what was going on in the other part of the globe. Yeah, internet connection was very weak. We had dial-up internet. So it makes it look more bad than it was yeah, before. Yeah, like I would say back in the days, a lot of worse things have happened. A lot of worse things have happened. And if we had social media in those days, maybe it's a possibility we might be saying Day of Judgment's coming uh, next week, Tuesday, Tuesday morning. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, look, yes, it does seem quite bad. Yes, things are happening, but again, it goes back to that narration, isn't it? That even if the day of judgment comes and you're Still planting, plant yeah, you finish planting that tree. And so coming to planting the tree now, yeah, because uh, look, when I went to Turkey, there was no thought Please. of planting trees and farming or any off grid. I wasn't on that mentality. I was on the mentality: let me go to a nice, warm country. My children were becoming sick in England all the time. Uh, I felt happier there. It was cheaper there. Food is better. People are a bit better. There's a beach, there is, but uh, everything, you know, it's a bit, a bit better. Yeah. Um, that's good. That's how people should be so, thinking anyway. So that's the reason I went. But subhanAllah, I mean, the amount of people then on the group started talking about this thing, you know, about the signs of their judgment. And they were like, we're interested in buying a farm. We want to get off grid. We want to get off away from the people. The hadith mentioning about going to the mountains and, you know, getting away from the people, being out of the city. So, and being that the most valuable commodity will be your, your livestock. You know, like animals and stuff. Yeah. So following these kind of hadith, and obviously we can't say this is what the hadith is saying. Yeah. But kind of pointing towards or hinting towards this. So and we see the LGBT thing happening, and you know people sending their children to school. But we're putting ourselves in like hot cake. You know, like not hot cake. Cake is a good thing. I mean poison. You know, we're poisoning kind of our our youth. And, uh, you know, the Sahaba Radhi and one of them, I forgot, I think it was Ali Radhi Alam, I think, who said that from the age of four, no, the age of seven to 14 is, is a very important age, that whatever you instill within that child, then that stays with them for the rest of their life. And that, part, you know, is part of their, uh, their belief system, basically, for the rest of their life. And this is something Ricky Gervais said as well, 
who's a famous atheist, and he said that someone asked him in an interview that even in the 21st century, how can people still believe in God? It doesn't make sense when you see all this, you know, advancements in science and technology. It makes you think that there is no God. But he said that the problem is, at a young age, this belief in God is instilled. And once that thing is instilled in the heart, it's very difficult to take it out. You know, it's like a disease. It just stays in. It's like a cancer, you know. So but this that, young age... That, that, that see, Ricky Gervais is wrong in that. Um, because this is the nature versus nurture debate. Yeah, he's he's gone with nurture, but we've got peer-reviewed journals that say that a person is born with the innate disposition of believing in a God, which we call fitra. This has actually been evidenced by Justin Barrow of Oxford University yeah. and Olivera Petrovic. I thought I'd just add okay. that in there. I might agree with that as well, but the thing is, what, no, we're, saying, like in terms of what we're saying is to solidify that belief on Allah, on the right direction. See, yeah. if you send your children to school, where they're being that even scientifically with... we can prove as well because your brain is in theta and delta waves because your brain has certain waves now we're both interacting in beta we're both aware when we're watching tv we're reacting in alpha Take when they're... yeah exactly because you know you... it's not an interaction so your brain kind of lets down its defenses and it goes to the take your children mind. off the tv or, this or, or just to kind of manage them. Take out the job. Yeah, or train them to manage how they consume content. Train them. Because not, yeah, not every parent can do that. So if you arm your children that, you know, if you're not going to be home, the children are going to be watching this stuff. So train them and then question them how they are. Are they interpreting it the correct way? But your brain is in theta and delta. And yeah, you're right. You are very impressionable. In fact, if you go to a hit me, I, I am impressionable. Yeah. Well, obviously, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Mike. Yeah, when you go to a hypnotist, he puts you, when he says relax, relax, you're in a deep sleep, you're relaxed, your body's relaxed. What he's doing is he's putting you into a theta state, which means that you're more impressionable and he speaks to your unconscious mind. So you're right, you're 100% right. When you're young, that's when we're out cabbing and our parents are in the, mum's in the kitchen, dad's cabbing or whatnot. And the kids are vegetating in front of the television. It's very important that we spend time with them, especially in the first 10 years, I would say. Yeah. First 10 years are essential. I mean, look, so, look, I went there on a holiday, enjoying my life, have a nice nature. And obviously the Azan is loud and the masjid is there and everything, you know. But then they kind of diverted me towards this farming thing, saying this off-grid thing is very important, taking your children out from the cities, away from the fitna. And... Uh, so I saw many multiple benefits in that as well. You know, any time I do something, I need to see multiple benefits. <laughs> so the guys, I guess, no. I don't think it's going to pick it up. Is it? No, it probably won't. But it's just, barely probably picking up all this thing. Is it? No, no, no. It's, it's quite good. Can you hear us? So, I think one of them said no. <laughs> it's not live. I'm not, I'm not that. I'm not that high level. But so you see, the thing is here is that. These guys kind of pushed me towards this off-grid thing and having your own self-sufficient farm where you don't need to get anything from outside. Now, the multiple benefits of that is, is that, first of all, food is an investment. You understand? We know until the end times, there's going to be food shortages. Yeah, before the jail appears, you know, the famine is going to happen. Where this food's going to be one-third, two-third, and then completely no food. Yeah? So there's going to be many food shortages. So we thought food investment is good. And you also follow Bill Gates and then they're buying up farmland. Yeah? So we thought food shortages. So Turkey is a very good country because it produces a lot of food. Yeah, it has a lot of fertile land. The weather's good. And it's also central location to the whole world. So you could go anywhere you want, you know, quite easily within four hours of a flight. So you can go to London, direct flights, and they're cheap as well, and they're easy access. And the, another thing is Turkey is quite, uh, what do you call it? It's got a European uh, standard to it. Most of its governments, its structures and hospitals and schools are quite professional. Yeah, so you, people feel comfortable moving from the West to a country like Turkey, which is the middle, middle Asia kind of thing. They don't want to go too Asian, where everything's a bit like, you know, up now, you know, <laughs> desi style. And there's not much protection, there's not much safety. So people chose Turkey as their main hijra place. People even, when I, I, got, I got people who came, made hijra to Indonesia, Malaysia, and then because of ter political turmoil there, they couldn't even go to the masjid. Foreigners weren't allowed to go to the masjid. There were many issues happening. And they weren't giving out residency permits. So the other next place everybody came is Turkey. So even from that side, you know, people who thought maybe Indonesia, Malaysia are good places, even that didn't work out. You know. 
So many, many people in their herds are coming to Turkey. It's a bit scary knowing that, you know, I kind of discovered it. That's not, I didn't discover it. But, but you know what I'm saying? So do you see the multiple benefits of this off-grid thing? That look, you take away your children, especially at that young age, you nurture them, you teach them how to survive in terms of like growing stuff, making their own food, and you keep them away from the fitna, keep them away from bad company, keep them away from the internet, keep them away from, you know, YouTube and movies and all this stuff that can really mess with their mind, you know, and in their growth uh, I think stage. it depends, it depends. Like some parents, they, they're able to invest in their kids, they're able to um, exercise that authority over them and they feel they can. Yeah, so for those parents, they might have a, a different kind of uh, plan for themselves, for their families. They might be involved in da'wah, they might be involved, they might want to serve the community in different ways. So for, for them, this concept of moving away is not going to be feasible. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's for everybody. Yeah. There's some people who are on a very extreme budget, some people yeah. with health problems, some people got other issues. But then when you some see... Some people are addicted to yeah. benefits. So. But, but, but the thing to notice here is, when, when something grows, like a weed, when it grows, if it's small, you can pull it out and then it, you can get rid of it. But when you allow something to grow and grow and grow and grow, the bigger it grows, the harder it becomes to root out. Yeah, you need, when it becomes a tree, you need like 12 people with chainsaws and lumberjacks to go and take down the tree. So the point that I'm trying to say is, if you notice that your family is becoming difficult for you to um, you know, teach them, assist them, guide them, then when you notice that it's a little bit, then you need to start thinking about these things. Now, if you, mean, you mean hijra or are you talking about off-grid? Well, I'm talking about both. So if you're in London, I mean, some people have moved up north, Blackburn, um, Leicester, these areas. Now, those areas are less intense. Um, you can influence your, your families and be, be more intimate with them. There's less of that kind of uh, influence. Intimate. Yeah. Not family, bro. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so, got face off. And then you can even move further up north, Scotland. Scotland. It's too cold down there, man. Mountains, it's always raining, those yeah, places. mountains. But again, it's you're talking about modern, and you're talking about still being in a country. You can still say the same thing with regards to Scotland as well. So that that's available also. If now you, you're talking about going off-grid, that's something that you need to get your kids used to when they're young. Yeah, that's not, you can't give them an iPad and an iPhone for the first 10 years and then suddenly take them off that. It's going to be very difficult for you to do that. So I mean, Turkey, like you said, is... It's a middle part. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's still somewhat feasible and reasonable. You can say the same about even England as well or, or different countries. But yeah, it depends, isn't it? It depends what hardship you're going through, what problem you're going through, or what kind of uh, issue or what kind of focus, objective you have for your family. But do you think it's too soon for people to be doing this, thinking that the world is going to end and we're going to have food crisis and we're going to have this problem? Do you think it's a bit too soon people are doing it? Uh, it or do you think this Ukraine war and then this virus thing that happened? And then... I, don't, I don't think, look, it's better to be prepared. It's better to be prepared than, uh, they say it's better to be prepared for something than an opportunity or a situation comes in where you're not prepared for it. It's always good to be prepared. Even like a lot of our parents, what they've done is they bought land in Pakistan. They don't go there very often, but whenever they do, it's there, isn't it? It's a backup. Yeah, and that's what they say. Look, one of these days, something's going to happen. You're going to have to go The, the elders have been saying that for a long they time. Have. Many people have pointed yeah. towards that. So land is getting expensive. And uh, like you said, there's a large influx of people. So yeah, it, it, logically, it makes sense for you to have a backup. And by the way, I haven't mentioned this to you, but you know, since the virus hit, property prices, land prices in Turkey have doubled in pounds and dollars. Yeah, because what happens there is whenever the economy crisis, the people safeguard their money, their currency, because it's always devaluing. They yeah. put it into property. Thing is, look, I'm not here promoting Turkey. Like, I don't know the Turkey situation. But yeah. what I'm saying is, generally speaking, it, it it's prudent for you to have a backup. Hmm. Yeah, It makes sense for you to have a backup. Yeah, Some people will say Turkey is in a very risky place. Yeah, It's in NATO. It's, um, it's used as the pathway from Europe to Asia. 
Um, it's it's there right at the border of Russia and, and um, NATO and, and Europe. So if something kicks off, naturally Turkey is going to have a big part to play. So some people are of that opinion. Some people are of the opinion. No, Turkey is strong. And, you know, again, it's, it's, they're saying it's the, the only Muslim country that's got lots of strength and yeah so some people are a big that army as well. yeah and and also some people are saying they're only using the nato thing for their own benefit yeah. and when the thing comes to shove they won't do nothing they won't, they won't follow what nato says do you understand yeah. so i mean it depends yeah it it depends it's up to you what you follow but this mentality of getting your kids into scouts and clubbing learning how to shoot learning how to grow your countries. I think it was no way that are collecting seeds and putting them in a vault just so, you know, in case things um, start becoming extinct, they still can regrow some of the plants and flowers. And it only makes sense. I mean, countries are prudent anyway. The technology is about 40, 50 years ahead of the general population anyway. So it only makes sense that they would be doing this. But yeah, growing your own stuff, uh, going on nature hikes and walks, getting in tune with nature, you know, walk, walking barefoot. I mean, I mean, you know, like, we've got, we got graduates here who don't know how to make a fire. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. And then, if something happens, Allah forbid, and we know that technology, some, you know, when they say that the, one of the, some of the final wars will be done with swords and, and people on horses. But this is a problem also. When people send their kids to madrasa, they expect the madrasa teacher to teach them everything. Mm. So when... People send their we don't, kids to we, schools. We don't have horses in Madrasa. No, but when they send their kids to That's schools, sticks. they expect the school to teach everything. Schools don't teach you how to tax or how to, you know, uh, do your own taxes. Even you the simple stuff. Yeah, they don't teach you about nutrition. They don't, well, not nutrition. Even doctors technically don't know about nutrition. It's not part of the MBBS. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're not told to kind of, yes, little growing a sunflower or, or strawberry or stuff like that. But the in-depth stuff that they learn in Norway, bro, the kids actually go for hikes. They go, they make their own jams and, you know, pickle, strawberry picking. And, and here there's like a big that. teacher about the Tudors and flipping. Uh, yeah, there is all that this kind rubbish of, crap. Yeah, there is that kind of obsession. But it, it's, it's high time that parents are more involved in their children. And it's not just about having kids. For I mean, the no, the homeschooling has grown a lot now. A lot of people are homeschooling, even non-Muslim, even it's, Christians. It's especially. actually good and it needs to be done because to be fair, like being a teacher for about six years, I would say that stuff you can teach at home. And the, a teacher, yeah. yeah. And in terms of um, it's the, the social side of things, you're just going to have to take care of that because otherwise your kid's going to be emotionally uh, stunted or socially stunted. Your kid has to be able to conduct conversations. They have to be around people. Whether you put them in an ice skating club, swimming club, archery club, sitting out there waiting for their club to finish, it's got to be done. So you see, with this off-grid thing, we've got many families, do you understand? There's, there's hundreds of families, do you understand, who mix, who have programs, and they meet and they gather and do things. So it's not like they're not going to meet other people, do you understand? Um, I mean, my children have been homeschooling for the past one or two years now. Yeah, so our move to Turkey doesn't make any difference because it just means you homeschool and we still meet with other Muslim families there. But with this off-grid thing, I mean, in investment-wise, it's a good idea, yeah, in terms of the land thing that we mentioned. Uh, safeguarding your children's iman and stuff is a good idea. And teaching them these lessons about how to grow their own food, how to be self-sufficient, I think it's a good idea as well at the same time. And uh, connecting with nature makes you connect with Allah, you know, and connecting with technology is connecting you with Dajjal more, more and more, you know, the more you, and this fitna and this evil, so yes, there are benefits for those people who, who can't get out of it and they have to use that avenues of technology to benefit themselves. But um, the natural way I feel is the, is the best way, you know. And um, so Especially that's... Especially with how artificial our society has become. Yeah, I mean, Many everything, in every like, level, food, uh, even yeah. our relationships, everything has become... Artificial. You know, uh, yes. tech, technology has taken over everything. Yes. So it feels like... You know, and, and on top of that, you see, if you read... And now um, we've got virtual reality coming as well and meta. And it's stuff just like not that. stopping. And the World Economic Forum, where they're mentioning this great reset, uh, it was actually, I was watching the video today actually, it was mentioning that uh, a quote from a person in the future, I don't know how they do this, mm. but they were saying that the, there's going to be communities, yeah, all living together, but then there's going to be outsiders. They use the term for outsiders. And they said, these outsiders don't want to mix with us. They want to live their own life the way they want to. 
And I'm thinking maybe they're predicting that the, most of the population will be jammed in little cities, little towns, everyone having a fixed amount of money, a fixed amount of food. So they're going to be fed and everything's going to be controlled. The economy, you know that from money, smart cities. Yeah. So everything's but, adding to But the weird thing is they mentioned in the World Economic Forum this quote that there's going to be outsiders who are going to be self-sufficient. They're going to be looking after themselves. Yeah. And they, call, they called it a term, I forgot what it was called. But you understand, this is how much they've predicted it. And their plans are out there. And you have to understand the World Economic Forum has had the world leaders come together. Yeah. And these guys have been planning this for a long time. So, and then you've got the virus hitting, then you've got this war happening in Ukraine. It's a bit, a bit like, the, I'm telling you, it's getting narrower and narrower. You know, you've and got... th that's why I'm thinking this off-grid thing kind of makes more sense to me now, more than it's ever before. Do you understand? When I first heard about these people on the group, I was these guys are. Imran Hussein followers, <laughs> you know, I thought these guys, you know, maybe they're on another level and you know, Masha, I leave them to be, you know, ch channel them away from me, basically, do you get it? Mm. But they kind of do make sense. But you did something which is wise. You went there a couple of times for holiday. Each time you went and explored different aspects, you eased yourself into it. And for, for a lot of people, I think that's the problem. Like they feel it's too daunting. Maybe take your advice, go there a couple of times, you know, get used to it, no pressure. And then when you're ready, make the transition. But there are, like we know from the narrations, also the Jal won't be able to enter Makkah and Medina. In other words, like those places would have lost their relevance and people will be in cities because they're not really like heavy uh, cities like say Riyadh and Jeddah and Johannesburg and Islamabad and Delhi and yeah, Washington and Paris and the likes. So you, you've got two types of futures. You've got the Orwellian future, George Orwell, and then you've got people don't mention this, but there's also a future of Huxley as well, of Brave New World. So Orwell says, oh, you governments want to suppress you and control you and coerce you and, you know, you're not going to have rights. Okay. But then Huxley says that there's going to be so much technology, there's going to be so much ease that people are going to willingly give, uh, give up their rights yeah. in, in such a way that it's going to be consensual. Yeah. People would say, oh, this is good. For, and this is what we're seeing with a lot of things that are coming by the governments and by these things. No, but we're supposed to do this. No, but doesn't it make sense to do this? And we turn on each other. So I'm of the school of thought that it will be very Huxley based and it goes with your economic forum one, which is that they'll understand and they'll appreciate the fact that, okay, they are outsiders, but that's what they are. They're outsiders. Most people will willingly want to come and live in smart cities. Why? Because of convenience. It's solely because of convenience. I mean, who doesn't have a phone nowadays? Yeah. The thing is, I deliberately sometimes when I come into the masjid, I won't have my phone. Or going shopping, I won't have my phone. Even take my watch off. Just have no technology on you and just kind of detox and just go and just do whatever. I mean, it's more natural that way. Even when I get calls, my, my phone is on silent. If I'm doing something, if I'm in the middle of something, it's unnatural for me to... I'm, I'm, I'm in a state of flow. Yeah, where you're creating, you're doing stuff and then you get a call... Now that state of flow gets disrupted. Moved, yeah, disrupted. Yeah, and now I have to speak 20 minutes about something that my mind isn't ready for yet. So there's ways that you can kind of train and understand and, and do these things. But definitely coming back to clearly the agenda of this conversation, which is to promote... The dodgy stuff. <laughs> to, to promote World War living, living off-grid and um, this whole Turkey kind of thing, which, which I think it's... I mean, I wouldn't say a Turkey thing. You see... Turkey is just the one that's opened its arms out to everyone and says, come. Not every country's done that. Do you understand? Otherwise, people, are, I'm, I'm open to other countries. Yeah. Do you understand? But there is, I don't feel people are moving to those countries. People are coming to Turkey for some reason. You're saying Turkey ticks the boxes that, that in majority, your opinion, no other country can tick. That I know of. Yeah. And from that. what I've discussed with people. Because yeah. I, every time someone comes in my group, every time someone meets me, I you tell them. Hisp, yeah. I tell them that I your ask sect. them. I ask them, yeah. Your cult. Why did you choose Turkey? When, <laughs> and I mentioned this as well. It's in the middle of all the all the crap. Yeah, it's in the middle of everything. Why are you choosing Turkey? So they said our signs, our istikhara, our our duas led us to this. Our mashara and our consultation led us to this. Do you understand? So I'm like, that's why it kind of led with me as well. Mm. Do you understand? We're all kind of just coming here, merging it. And then there is a hadith, yeah, where the Prophet of Nabi mentioned. That near the end times, there's going to be three factions. I don't want to mention, uh, the, you know, the actual words, but 
So basically, the Sahaba asked which groups, one. Yeah. Group, you could say groups. You could say I don't know. Allah, Allah knows best. Hayz. So, thank you. So, so he said, which one should we join? Your and, group. <laughs> and and the Prophet Sallallahu said, join the one near in Sham, because that is the blessed land. Yeah. And Sham, as we mentioned in many many uh, narrations. Yeah. Yeah, about being blessed. So we can't go to Sham, the actual Sham, but we can be near it, the closest place, most safest, most beautiful, most easy for us, the people in the West, happens to be <laughs> South Turkey, yeah, uh -huh. not Istanbul, that place is a... It's, it's, is that what the Hadith says? It? it says go near Sham, do you understand? Okay. Okay. Does it say go near Sham? Sorry, in Sham. Okay. <laughs> you see? See, this is a... You think I see Jesus. Okay. Like, you understand. Okay, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Into the hadith. May Allah forgive me. So the hadith was talking about me and my dad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shut up. So, okay, so look, this is what he's saying. So we kind of chose Turkey for that as well. Many for people, what? Some people mentioned that. For what? The Sham thing. <laughs> okay, they said because we can be to South Turkey, we can be yeah. near Sham, okay. and you know, and another thing geographically, the area that we chose Antalya is surrounded by mountains, it's okay. surrounded by agriculture, yeah, it's surrounded by good weather, so it's it's kind of known for farming South Turkey. Okay, yeah, it provides food for the rest of Turkey. Nice. So um, that's another reason we chose it, and we want to be away from Constantinople, Istanbul. Because yeah, that's, mentioned, sense, that's mentioned. That's mentioned on hadith as well about it being taken over. Whether it's been done or not, Allah knows best. Yeah. What do you think about the way? Do you think it's been taken over, or do you think Allah knows best? Allah knows best. I yeah. don't know. I haven't looked into it. Okay. Yeah. We're speaking to the wrong guys. Use this. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, it's, uh, remember I told yeah, you. Yeah, you can't. It's all vague. No, we when don't you know. were talking to me, I said, I'd, I've listened to you. I mean, you've looked into this. I mean, you've gone into a country. Surely you've done your research. And Surely I all, have. Oh, yeah, all these people, when I clearly haven't. Yeah. I mean, look, on top of that, I mean, I forgot one more thing. It's the crash. People are expecting a huge crash, economic crash. Okay. Yeah, so not, there's no cars coming. So they're expecting a huge crash, just like the one in 2008, but this time much bigger. See, the thing that happened in 2008 was just because of a housing crash. This, the whole world stopped because of the virus. Yeah. For, I don't know, one year, one and a half years, everything literally stopped. Yeah. And the prices of everything, stocks, kept going up, the prices of properties kept going up, everything just kept going up. So everyone is expecting everything to level up now. Because, yeah. But they're saying this will be a much bigger crash, a crash that no one has ever seen. Do you know what I mean? So on top of that, the crash thing, when the crash happens... Each crash has been a crash that we've never seen. Okay, so yeah, So but this, is, but this one yeah. has got a virus on top of it, where the I world stopped. When has the world stopped?